Apologies for the minor delay. I'm Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy. This is day 125 of the October 7 war. IDF fatalities since the start of the October 7 massacre remain constant at 564 since yesterday's update. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu delivered remarks last night in English laying out the case for total victory over Hamas in the wake of the October 7 massacre. Victory that will be judged against the three goals the government set after Hamas declared war. Destroying Hamas, freeing the hostages and ensuring that Gaza never again pose a threat to the Israeli people. The Prime Minister explained that total victory over this Iranian proxy in Gaza will ensure Israel's security and pave the way for additional peace accords with our Arab neighbors. Anything short of total victory would leave Hamas free and emboldened to repeat the October 7 atrocities as it has promised to do again and again. It would also embolden Iran and its other proxies, Hezbollah, the Houthis, etc., to step up their aggression in the Middle East and threaten the entire free world as they seek to do. Total victory, therefore, is the only conceivable outcome for Israel. The Prime Minister also explained that total victory is within reach and is a matter of months away. The IDF is far exceeding expectations despite facing a uniquely challenging counter-terror battlefield that no army in history has ever had to confront. In just four months, the IDF has shattered 18 out of 24 battalions and killed, wounded or captured over 20,000 terrorists, more than half of Hamas's fighting force. The IDF is systematically destroying the vast underground tunnel network Hamas built under civilian areas, demolishing rocket factories and stockpiles and more. Intense IDF military pressure also secured the release of 110 hostages. And this government's position is that only more military pressure will get the remaining 136 home. Unfortunately, Hamas's response demanded Israel's complete capitulation, which would leave its terrorist army free and emboldened, to take more hostages in future and would only invite further massacres of the sort we endured on October 7th. The IDF has also taken all this action against Hamas's military machine while taking unprecedented steps to protect civilians, despite Hamas's efforts to maximize humanitarian suffering and despite the shameful failure of international agencies to support Israel's humanitarian efforts. Those efforts will continue nevertheless as the IDF dismantles the main Hamas stronghold of Khan Yunus and advances on its last bastion, Rafah. We will, of course, secure safe passage for civilians out of a war zone where terrorists are trying to use them as human shields, in some cases stopping them from leaving at gunpoint and stealing the humanitarian aid generously donated by the international community. In our intelligence estimates, up to 60% of that international aid is being hijacked by Hamas. The Prime Minister also elaborated in his remarks on his 3D vision for peace. For peace between Israel and Gaza, the destruction of Hamas will have to be followed by the demilitarization of Gaza and the de-radicalization of Palestinian society. To prevent a resurgence of the military machine that perpetrated the October 7 massacre, Israel will need to maintain overriding security control over Gaza. That means Israeli forces will retain the ability to operate wherever and whenever necessary to stamp out a terrorist resurgence. Israel has no intention of governing Gaza or its people. That task must fall to a civilian administration staffed by people committed to routing terrorism, not rooting for it. To ensure sustainable peace, there must be de-radicalization to tackle the genocidal Hamas ideology that led to October 7. A massacre involving not only UNRWA staff, but hundreds of UNRWA graduates. And as international donors now think about what to do with those funds they have suspended to UNRWA, the question they should be asking is not how many UNRWA staff participated in the October 7 massacre, but how many UNRWA school graduates participated in the massacre. And if indeed 70% of the population of the Gaza Strip is falsely classified by the United Nations as refugees and receiving education services from the United Nation, it only stands to reason that around 70% of the perpetrators of the October 7 massacre were in fact graduates of the UN-run, internationally funded schools in Gaza that have been raising generation upon generation on a diet of jihad and martyrdom. UNRWA's schools indoctrinate Palestinian children to genocide and terror. They have brutalized generations of Palestinian children. The next generation must be educated toward peace. 
We therefore call on the international community to replace UNRWA with responsible aid agencies capable of educating Palestinian children in a way that paves a way for peace and capable of delivering humanitarian aid to people in Gaza while stopping Hamas from hijacking it and calling it out when it does. Israel would of course welcome the participation of moderate Arab states, which have already successfully de-radicalized their school curricula over the past decade in creating a different and better future for Gaza. Israel's total victory over the Hamas October 7 machine is coming. Destroying Hamas, demilitarizing Gaza, de-radicalizing Palestinian society. That is the recipe for turning that impending total victory over Hamas into a pathway for peace in our region. To bring this war to its speediest conclusion, we urge the international community, allies and other nations to stand by our side, demand the immediate and unconditional release of the hostages we fear are being starved, tortured, raped and executed in the Hamas terror dungeons, and demand the immediate and unconditional surrender of the terrorists who perpetrated the October 7 atrocities and have spent every day since then threatening to repeat them again and again. That's it for today's update. We will, of course, as always, take your questions. Thank you. The first question comes from Joel Pollack of Breitbart News. Could you comment on the significance of the visit of President Javier Millet of Argentina this week? And the second question is, does Israel object to the suggestion by Antony Blinken last night that Israel mu must not dehumanize Palestinians? Uh, Israel, of course, welcomes all solidarity visits from leaders around the world. In the immediate days after the October 7 massacre, we saw many world leaders coming and we're very happy that that is continuing with the profound solidarity visit of President Millet. I'd note that just earlier today, uh, President Millet visited uh, near Oz, together with President Herzog. Near Oz, a community, of course, in which one quarter, one quarter of its residents were either murdered or abducted. Uh, on October 7th. Um, it's very important that world leaders continue to come to Israel and bear witness, bear witness to the atrocities of October 7th and stand by Israel's side as we continue to prosecute and uh, go after the monsters who perpetrated that massacre and have been threatening to do it again. Of course, we hope that will convert itself into tangible uh, diplomatic uh, support. Uh, as for your second question, I don't think that's a fair question. Um, I think if you look very closely at Secretary Blinken's remarks, and the U.S. administration has been standing four square by us as we have been fighting Hamas and bringing it to justice after the October 7 massacre. Uh, that was not intended in any way as criticism uh, of Israel. I said that cannot be a license to dehumanize others. Uh, absolutely right. There should be no dehumanization. We're all human beings. And that's why Israel remains committed to fighting for humanity on the front lines of humanity and upholding the highest standards of international humanitarian law and human decency as we fight a terrorist enemy that has as much regard for humanitarian law as for basic humanity. The next question comes from Leo Soroka of the Washington Post. Will the Israeli War Cabinet meet tonight to discuss Hamas's ceasefire proposal, and is it still on the table after the PM called it delusional? Uh, the Prime Minister has been clear about his red lines regarding uh, release of the hostages. We're, of course, doing everything we can in order to get those hostages out. Time is running out for them. Time has already run out for the 31 hostages uh, who uh, have already been killed. In, uh, who have already been killed in captivity. Uh, the uh, total withdrawal of Israeli forces and an end of this war is, of course, not an option. Hamas was calling for complete capitulation that would leave it free and emboldened to perpetrate another massacre. And we will, of course, continue all our efforts, uh, everything possible to bring those uh, hostages home safely to their families. The next question comes from David Isaac of JNS. Did the 132 aid trucks at Kerem Shalom the protesters said they had blocked on Tuesday eventually go through anyway? And if so, were the trucks inspected before going into Gaza? Second, if Hamas is, is siphoning off 60% of the aid, is the government planning to stop the aid until it figures out a better distribution system? Uh, as for your first question, uh, regarding the distribution of humanitarian aid and operations at the crossing points, I'll refer your question to COGAT, uh, which deals specifically with the admission of aid into the Gaza Strip. Uh, you make a very important point about the amount of aid that has been hijacked by Hamas. We've been si sounding the alarm uh, for weeks now, uh, distributing footage of Hamas hijacking aid. We think it is horrific that the UN agencies responsible for distributing aid have been covering that up 
instead of calling Hamas out for the way that it has been hijacking aid. I see the images of uh, civilians looting trucks and my heart goes out to them because they know that the de facto authorities in Gaza have been stealing their aid and the international community has done nothing to um, the international community has done nothing to stop that. Uh, if you look at the provisions in international law regarding the provision of humanitarian aid in war zones and our obligation to facilitate the provision of life-saving humanitarian aid to the extent that it is not stolen by the enemy or gives it a specific military advantage. By any account, Israel is going above and beyond its obligations under the laws of armed conflict in order to ensure that humanitarian aid reach the people in Gaza who need it while making sure Hamas cannot steal it. We are, of course, acutely monitoring the humanitarian situation inside the Gaza Strip. We welcome uh, the donations of food to the civilian population. We do not, of course, want to see humanitarian uh, distress in there, and that's why we've gone above and beyond uh, our obligations. Uh, and we repeat our call for the international community to urgently find replacements to UNRWA. It is important that humanitarian aid reach civilians, but that has to go through the UN agencies that have experience doing emergency relief in war zones, not through an organization that is collaborating with, covering up for, and in cahoots with a terrorist organization. UNRWA has been doing a terrible job, and now we see its leaders casting blame onto Israel in order to cover up the fact that they've been doing such a terrible job of aid delivery and covering up for Hamas, because unfortunately, scapegoating Israel is always the easiest way to avoid responsibility. Dr. Abby Korb asks,